This program is made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation, a co-production by Mississippi Public Broadcasting and the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. April 20th, 2010, 41 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, BP's Deepwater Horizon Drilling Unit exploded after high-pressure methane gas engulfed the rig and exploded. 11 people would lose their lives that night. For nearly three months, oil gushed into the Gulf of Mexico. Marine life, tourism, and petroleum operations will never be the same in the Gulf region. Now there are questions that have scientists focusing on trying to shed light on the unknown long-term effects on the Gulf. This is The Science of the Spill. Hello and welcome to The Science of the Spill. I'm Aaron Pickens. And I'm Dr. Bob Thomas, Director of the Center for Environmental Communication at Loyola University. The Science of the Spill is produced by the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory and Mississippi Public Broadcasting to inform the public with scientifically proven facts concerning the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And Dr. Thomas, I think we can all agree that there are many myths and some information out there not based on scientific data about the effects of the spill. That's right, Aaron. We're going to bring together scientists that are studying this disaster for informative discussions to give the facts about issues related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And we also want to let you know that you can find more on our companion website, SpillScience.com. There you can find in-depth information about topics related to the spill, as well as video discussions from scientists studying the effects of the spill on the Gulf of Mexico. You may also want to join the discussion on our blog section of the site, where you can engage in discussions with scientists studying the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Again, that's SpillScience.com. Well, Louisiana has suffered a loss of its coastal wetlands at an alarming rate for many years. Has the oil spill had any impact on this problem? We visited with scientists and traveled to an area in Louisiana directly impacted by the oil, Bay Jimmy and Barataria Bay, for a first-hand look at this issue. I think a lot of people in, in Mississippi and Louisiana and, and, and uh, this part of the Gulf Coast are, are very interested in um, the natural progression of their coastline and, and the fact that we're losing a lot of coastal land every day. Um, a lot of people are, are, are worried that by introducing oil at high concentrations into these um, ecosystems that it will inhibit the natural processes that trap sediment and help counterbalance the loss of, of these coastal environments. Um, so our research will, will hope hopefully help um, determine whether ge geomorphologic changes, that's a fancy word for changes in the rate at which we gain or lose coastline, that, that will hopefully help us determine whether or not changes in these processes can be linked to the oil spill. So here we are out in Bay Jimmy, which is on the, the northern part of uh, Barataria Bay. Uh, and a lot of oil accumulated out here in Bay Jimmy. It, uh, it came up uh, through the passes. There are some passes that are due south, passes being the term down here for, for tidal inlets. The oil came through the passes and probably got washed ashore on the edge of these marshes under the influence of southerly winds. Over there you can see where the oil uh, is and has been. Uh, some of the darker spots over there are most likely still oil. Uh, you can see that the oil stayed in the front, let's say five to ten yards of the marsh. This is something um, that seems to have been something of a widespread pattern. We've often talked about marshes as good traps and good filters, and this is probably the best example I've seen of it, is that the marsh grass has trapped much of the oil in the front five to ten yards. So I think that while this spill was certainly a, a nightmare and a disaster, we you know, it has to be put in the context of a coast that is unfortunately in a state of, of degradation. So what we've got here is a bunch of plant stems and plant roots and old plant material. And this was, most likely this was all marsh, you know, some years ago that has uh, sunk into the sea. So this is part of, part of the story of South Louisiana is right here in this anchor. If you take the amount of shoreline that was oiled and you, you multiply it by the uh, the length of, of the, excuse me the width that uh, that was actually oiled, you multiply some several hundred miles by something that's maybe 10 yards. You only get 
maybe on the order of 10 square miles or less uh, of coastline that was uh, impacted, which is incidentally less than the amount of coastline that we lose in an average year. We lose somewhere on the order of 25 square miles of coastline on in an average year, and in a bad year, much more than that. In the month surrounding Katrina and Rita, the coast lost somewhere close to 250, maybe a little less than 250 square miles worth of land. One thing that you can see is that the oil did uh, lead to some mortality of the marsh plants. You can see what appear to be some dead marsh plants over there, the brown, uh, the brown marsh is most likely dead. You can also see in the middle over there, you can see some new shoots coming up. And those are most likely shoots that have come up uh, since the oiling event. So it's most likely some regrowth after the marsh, um, after the oiling event. The basic story, I think, of what's going on is that the plants, um, the plant roots didn't die. We've uh, one of the biggest concerns people had when this oil was going to, when the spill was breaking, was would it kill the roots? And people asked myself and people asked other people, will everything die off? And, and a lot of people said, it depends on what happens to the roots. If the roots die off, we could lose the marsh. And they, by extension, if the roots don't die off, things can regrow. I think if we had proper restoration efforts in place decades ago, we would have had complete barrier islands like the Chandler Islands. We would have had complete marshes in the Bluxy Marshes. And it's just the physical nature of things. You have more avenues for this oil to enter. So if we had complete marshes in the Biloxi Marshes, yes, we still would have gotten damaged, but so much of the interior marsh, which is very important for juvenile organisms to spawn, would still be intact. We wouldn't have seen, probably would not have seen oil getting as far in as Lake Punch Train. And it's, just, it's just a matter of physics. You, if you had more physical boundaries between the oil and the interior marshes, we would have had less problems. Now let me also say, though, that we need natural barriers. If you're throwing artificial barriers up there that will not be permanent, that are not held in place by plants and root systems, it's a waste of time. You need to support the natural restoration of the marshes and of the barrier islands. It was very interesting to examine the added ingredient of the oil spill on larger, longer-lasting issue of coastal wetland loss in Louisiana. Let's turn to Dr. Bob Thomas for a discussion on this issue with our in-studio panelists. Bob. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, our panelists today are Dr. Mark Peterson, who is a professor of coastal studies at the uh, Gulf Coast Research Lab in Ocean Springs, and Carrie St. Pei, who is the executive director of the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program in Thibodeau, Louisiana. Uh, Mark, uh, tell us something about your research background. Um, my research deals with fish ecology mainly as it relates to salt marsh and coastal habitat and losses or impacts of those habitat and how it impacts fishes and crabs and shrimp and things like that. And Kerry, your background? Uh, I spent my years after college uh, in uh, working for the state of Louisiana uh, in the Division of Water Pollution Control. Uh, and for the past 13 years, I've been director of the National Estuary Program. Well, Dr. Alec Holker of the Louisiana University Marine Consortium pointed out that, uh, that all of the coastal wetlands that have been impacted by the oil spill thus far uh, amounts to less than we lose in coastal Louisiana in a given year. Uh, give us a background, Carrie, if you can, about uh, uh, why this historical loss of Louisiana coastal wetlands has occurred. Well, in uh, southeast Louisiana is a, a product uh, of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River drains two-thirds of the United States and uh, every year uh, after the spring floods, after the snow melt, we had this enormous amount of sediment coming down here with the water uh, and it would flood its banks um, uh, depositing new silt on the the sinking coast. Uh, the coast has been sinking for 10,000 years. It's just that the, uh, it was offset, the sinking, with uh, new layers of sediment. Uh, the river changed course about eight times over geologic time, depositing new deltas and building land. Um, in the last 75 years, we've destroyed that uh, sequence of events that built the land. Uh, we've levied off the Mississippi River. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps we've built locks and dams in the upper part of the watershed, so we don't even have uh, the uh, early amounts of sediment that the river once carried. 
Uh, so even though you have the levees down here, which are keeping, keeping from flooding, um, we probably wouldn't have enough sediments to offset the, the subsidence. Well, Mark, how about Mississippi and other coastal states? Are they losing the same thing? Well, in Mississippi, it's, it's luckily we're very unique in that we don't have nearly the problem they do in Louisiana. But we do have an area on the eastern part of our state on the Alabama state line called Grand Bay. It, uh, the part in Mississippi is a National Estuarine Research Reserve, and there was a stream that flowed into there uh, thousands of years ago called, called the Escatapa River. It was stream captured. It was sucked into, if you will, the Pascagoula River. So sediment, just like in Louisiana, is no longer flowing out to accrete uh, the wetlands. And we also have a, a very strong southeastern wind pattern that's eroding some of the small bear islands there and some of the, uh, the salt marshes there. But pretty much in the rest of the state, uh, it's, not, it's not bad at all. So it's more coastal barrier islands than it is coastal wetlands along that part of the coast. Yeah, and we have some small barrier islands, but you can clearly see some erosion on the salt marsh from that southeastern wind, but it's not being replenished, as Kerry talked about. But it's a much smaller scale problem than, sure. than we have in Louisiana. Well, Kerry, you know, we know that this is an enormous problem. Why is it important to the citizens of Mississippi and Louisiana that these coastal wetlands are disappearing the way they are? Uh, well, uh, we have an enormous uh, wetland loss issue, and uh, the, the wetlands are a part of our uh, of our um, culture. Uh, aside from that, uh, the wetlands produce uh, an enormous amount of fisheries for the nation, um, and they house uh, all the oil pipelines, which are protected from with the uh, marshes uh, and the oil infrastructure. Everything is protected with the marsh and ridge infrastructure. Our communities, um, our communities are very vulnerable now uh, with uh, storm surges. Uh, they could cause uh, an increase in insurance rates. Uh, we no longer have the, the ridges and uh, marshes to offset, to, to buffer that storm surge. Uh, so um, at the very least, uh, they should be concerned uh, for what the estuary produces uh, both uh, renewable natural resources uh, and uh, non-renewable -re natural resources as well as uh, insurance rates that affect the whole country. Mm -hmm. and, and not to, to mention the, uh, the cultural impacts that we have along our coast. We're so tightly tied to these wetlands. Uh, the, uh, Louisiana has done a number of things to try to mitigate the, uh, the possible disaster of the oil coming in. Uh, including opening the, the river diversions uh, to their full extent and uh, building berms off of our coast. And it's been somewhat controversial. Um, uh, tell, tell us briefly about the building of the berms I and mean, what do they look like and what are they supposed to do? Uh, well, the idea was that uh, we'd build sand berms, uh, you know, uh, on top of uh, our barrier islands or in front of the barrier islands uh, to reduce the, the amount of oil coming in shore. Um, the problem with that is that uh, this was a very uh, hastily dreamed up, uh, you know, procedure, uh, and it didn't have the uh, scientific, uh, you know, background uh, in building it. These were sand berms about six feet high, uh, they were essentially sand levees that would be built, uh, and uh, they were. Uh, Subject to uh, the wave actions uh, from hurricanes and uh, you know tropical storms, and the the, the fear was that they would uh, just be eroded away. Um, but the biggest problem with building the sand berms um, is that uh, it was using a sand resource that could could have been used for legitimate Barry Island restoration. We do need to restore our barrier islands. And everybody in Louisiana, all the scientific community supports uh, barrier island restoration. Uh, but to build sand levees in, in the front of our barrier islands, uh, you, you would have storm surges coming in. Uh, and to build a sand berms takes uh, a resource. Mm -hmm. They would uh, harvest sand from where it is in the Gulf and deposit it on the baryons in the form of sand berms. Uh, and the wave actions from the hurricane storm surges and whatever would dissipate, disperse the sand all over 
you know, the internal estuary, and it would no longer be available for legitimate Barry Island restoration. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest uh, fear. Um, they were very costly. Uh, we built five miles of berm uh, at a cost of $180 million. Um, we restored Timberlayer Island, for example, uh, pre-Hurricane Katrina for $12 million uh, at about five miles of, of that Barry Island. So they were very expensive, um, and uh, uh, we don't know how much uh, good they did. Yeah. Well, it, you know, they've been very controversial, and, and the, the governor, it's been widely reported that, that the governor and, and other community leaders have called for, uh, for building the berms and continuing the construction. Uh, at the same time that it's been widely reported that the scientific community is not supporting it, as you, as you have just suggested, uh, why do those community leaders want to build these berms? Well, that was a that was a feeling that they had to do something. You know, everybody was concerned about the oil coming in Louisiana, uh, and they had to do something. And the the perception was that they would stop the oil from coming in. Mm -hmm. When the reality was that they didn't at all. I mean, uh, you build a sand berm on the front of the Barry Island, or you don't have that sand berm, and the the oil hits the Barry Island, so what's, what's the deal? You, you clean it up oil off sand either way. Right. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the usefulness of the sand berms was questionable. Right, and the scientific community is opposed because? Because it was an enormous waste of resource. Yeah. Yeah. And also there's science, there, there's concerns about the, the science of the construction as well. Well, the, the whole shape, uh, the shape of the, the, the berms was in the form of a levee, um, and um, the shape of the uh, Barry Island is not in the form of a levee, it's, it gradually slopes, <clears throat> and uh, you know, the, the shape was all wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, that has caused quite a controversy in our state and beyond because it pits uh, community leaders who are there to help the public against the scientific community that's been out there for decades working on these issues, so it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, regarding the, uh, the diversions on the river, um, uh, tell us what the Davis Pond Diversion Project is and give the audience a feel for what <coughs> river diversions are about. Well, the Davis Pond Diversion was actually uh, thought of as a, a way to help oyster production. It's, uh, it has a maximum of 10,000 uh, cubic feet per second of flow. It uh, flows uh, river water from in, uh, from the river, Mississippi River, into Lake Catawachi. Uh, and the operation of Davis Pond is governed by a five, par five parts per thousand line, which is uh, down near Little Lake, uh, down into the system. It's it's about where the uh, the five parts per thousand line was in 1956. Um, and uh, when, when the saltwater line uh, at, at Little Lake becomes greater than, than uh, five parts per, th parts per thousand, they would release more water. Uh, so it was meant to uh, introduce sediments and nutrients into uh, the marshes to, to re restore uh, some of that hydrology that, that we lost over the years. Um, and it was meant to uh, do so in a way that we could still maintain oyster production. Oysters do need salt water to survive, and uh, several estuarine species need, need salt water to survive and, and grow. Um, but Davis Pond does a perception that uh, you would fill the system with fresh water and create a positive flow and keep the, um, the oil out. Mm -hmm. um, but in Louisiana, we have a very weak tidal system. Uh, it's dominated by winds. Uh, wind direction has everything to do with stacking up water in, in our in internal system. Uh, so the release of uh, maximum flow, 10,000 CFS water from the river, uh, ended up killing oysters um, uh, at a critical time of year, the time they were spawning. Uh, and uh, the uh, su success at keeping oil out was very questionable. It, it, in my opinion, it did nothing to keep the oil out. 
uh, of the internal estuary. Yeah, well, that was my follow-up question was it, that is it being effective with the oil and you say no? No, uh, there's no question. Um, there's a perception uh, that the positive flow uh, would uh, keep the oil out, but mm -hmm. uh, it's too far up in the system uh, to uh, impact the the passes. Yeah. Have there been any unintended consequences that you haven't mentioned yet? Uh -huh from opening, you know, at mass, maximum capacity. Well, it, it, it's killed a lot of oysters. Uh, we did oyster surveys, uh, you know, about three weeks ago, and all the oysters uh, are dead uh, in, in the upper half of uh, uh, Barataria Bay all the way up. Um, and the concern there is that uh, uh, there won't be any, any spawning success uh, to generate new oysters for the following years, the next year and the years after that. Yeah. What's your opinion on Dr. Marty McConnell at the University of New Orleans' assertion that uh, had we had these restoration programs in place for decades that, uh, that we would have a healthy barrier island system? I agree totally with that. Uh, we, we need uh, land. We, uh, the land loss area uh, in Louisiana is critical. Uh, we've lost so much land uh, that uh, the uh, our communities are at risk. Uh, salt water is encroaching into fresh water. Uh, we need to rebuild land masses. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for inviting us. Thank yes. you. Well, we recently traveled to Louisiana to visit several state and private universities where scientists are studying the impacts of oil on the different habitats in the Gulf of Mexico and on the interconnectivity of the food web. Let's see what those scientists have to say. The optimists say that, well, the oil is gone, and uh, it, we don't see it in the water column anymore. And then it turns up in a bottom layer. And uh, some of the folks before this bottom layer was discovered say, well, the bacteria have worked exceptionally fast. It's, it's just gone. We still don't really know. We don't know what the condition of that settled layer is. Is it largely degraded? Is it toxic? Are all the lightweight components out of it, the things that could likely be toxic? We don't know. So there is that immediate oil hitting the shore, but a lot of that oil that's on the surface is now gone. Uh, gone where? It's a really good question. Uh, but part of the answer is that some of it is still out there in the environment. It's lying on the bottom. And it's lying on the bottom close to coastlines. And so even though this initial surface oil has disappeared, we might think that the initial exposure has disappeared. But what's really important to keep in mind is that future storm events are going to resuspend some of that oil back into the water column and re-expose some beaches and some marsh habitats. And any critters that are burrowing down into that sand or burrowing down into the sediment of marshes where some of this oil is stored are going to be continuously exposed over a long period of time. Speaking and hearing about some of the scientists who worked with the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, especially with their herring problem, and what the situation there was, this species was a commercial species doing fairly well right after the oil spill a cohort came back, the next three or four years everything seemed fine, but then later on they stopped showing up and then the, the problem started four or five years after the situation. And that's what we might be looking at here. We're not going to see an extirpation like we saw in Alaska. It's a different system altogether. But we have commercial species that have probably been impacted at the larval stage. They are not going to be around here in four or five years. We need to realize that. We need to kind of point out ways to mitigate that and long-term effects. And again, people say oil out of sight, out of mind. This is something that's going to be long-term, unfortunately, here in Mississippi and in southeast Louisiana. You know, when you look at the ocean and you look at the obvious products that come from it, uh, you see great big fish and you see great big lobsters and big crabs and big shrimps, and that's what you see in the market. But there's an awful lot of background to this that you must understand in terms of how that gets there. How does it grow up? Where does it reproduce? What does it feed upon? What kind of habitat does it live in? They have these life histories that utilize all these different levels. And so they exemplify that it's all interconnected. You can't talk about that fish unless you're talking about the algae on the bottom in terms of is there a good environment in which that fish can grow up in? Well, I'm studying the diversity of the marine algae or the seaweed. So what I'm interested in is looking at what's out there in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, also now with that oil spill, is how the oil spill could have affected the number of species and the quality of the species that was there before. 
So what is so important about the organisms I'm stirring is uh, for the whole ecosystem of the Gulf, for the vitality of the Gulf, is that they are the primary producers, meaning they are the ones that produce the oxygen. And we all know if there is no oxygen, the whole rest of the ecosystem is going to go berserk, basically. So that's why uh, it's so important to have the algae that are healthy and not being affected by negative effects of the oil, etc. To really uh, make sure that they can produce the oxygen and that the rest of the Gulf stays healthy. But a lot of our questions about whether or not this is going to create a hypoxic or an anoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico and beyond hinges on how much oil originally came out, how fast is it moving and mixing with, uh, with the water mass and with other um, sources of carbon, and uh, how, how long is it taking for that oil to, to biodegrade. Um, in terms of, of landed oil, again, um, one, one of the fascinating things that we've noticed through our sampling is that the, the sampling is, or, or where oil is washing up is very spatially heterogeneous. That's a, a fancy way of saying it's splotchy. You can be in one marsh and you can find oil up to your ankles, literally, and you can go a few miles away and, and not find a trace of the oil. Um, so it's interesting how it's been transported from fairly far offshore into these sensitive ecosystems and how um, natural currents have and, and wind patterns have, have cordoned it into certain areas and kept other areas relatively oil clean. So it seems like the event is over uh, and it's over for a lot of people that, that make their living here. But they make their living on the organisms that live in a lot of these marshes or at least the, the ecosystem health is what supports a lot of this economy. And the effects on ecosystem health I don't think we've seen those yet. Those haven't emerged yet. The fears that, that folks have about, will I, will I see those communities come back that I've grown to depend upon being there, whether I simply go to the restaurant to eat them or whether I'm out there as a scuba diver or a fisherman uh, enjoying that community for a variety of other reasons, will those be there again? I think we're going to be able to shed some light on that very soon. So we see that there are many issues on a variety of levels relating to the oil impacts on the Gulf of Mexico. Let's turn to the scientists here today to discuss these issues in more detail. Bob. Well, thank you very much. Our guests in this segment are both from the Gulf Coast Research Lab uh, in Ocean Springs and uh, Dr. Mark Peterson, who you've already met, is a professor of coastal sciences uh, at the lab. And uh, our new guest is Dr. Patrick Biber, who's an associate professor of coastal sciences also at the lab. Thank you. Welcome. Good to have you all with us today. Good to be here. A, a common theme that, uh, that we're, we've heard a lot about uh, after the oil spill uh, has been this issue of interconnectivity in, in ecosystems. And uh, it's sort of a recurring theme that people keep wanting to talk about because it's very important. Tell us a little bit, Mark, if you will, about that interconnectivity of species, especially in the realm of food webs. Sure. How they relate to us as citizens of the coast. Okay. Um, it, it tends to be a complex sort of process, and it's it's hard for uh, non scientists to understand. But it, an easy way to think about it is is organisms that tend to spawn offshore, for example, like crabs or shrimp, a number of fishes, uh, uh, move inshore into the salt marsh nursery areas uh, uh, for protection from predators, for food and whatnot. So that interconnectivity there, within that argument. They also uh, uh, feed in different places in terms of the food web aspect, and they utilize different resources, whether they're inshore in estuaries or offshore in the Bear Islands or even up in rivers. A lot of these systems in our uh, part of the world are very river dominated, and, and a classic example of this is the Gulf sturgeon. One of the fishes that I work on is a threatened species. They spawn up river as adults, and they spend about six months up river. They do not feed. And then they move back down. The juveniles and smaller individuals stay in the estuary proper, but the adults move to the Bear Islands, and they feed all winter long, and then they start that cycle over again. And so there's a huge connectivity. If you put up dams, you put up a uh, block blockage, they can't uh, complete that life cycle. And, and these animals don't understand state lines or county lines or any kind of barriers. They just simply have evolved to sort of do things they do. And so if you break that connectivity, you break down the food web in many ways. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. O'Connell mentioned in the, uh, in the video about uh, after the Exxon Valdez spill in Prince William Sound that uh, the first year the herring fishery was very strong and, uh, and it was strong the next couple of years and in the fourth year it absolutely collapsed. Um, knowing that you're not a, necessarily a specialist in herring, what does that really mean in the Gulf of Mexico? Are we watching that, see if it happens there? Well, I, th I think some people are probably doing that. I know. Uh, um, 
there's probably three ways that you can look at this sort of longer term decline, if you will. One is there's immediate impact, so you, you impact the adult stock or the juvenile uh, 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 offspring that would become adults the next season uh, by direct impact of the oral, and, and certainly a lot of that did happen. The second, and a little bit uh, less understandable, is the impact on reproduction of these fish. If you can have, you can have a small impact early and it might build from one spawning cycle to the next spawning cycle in adults, and that's sort of a cumulative impact to where you can then see the population size going down as the population size reduces because of reduced uh, reproduction, then your spawning stock biomass, the, the number that's out there, uh, can be impacted. And third, the sort of long-term impact in my mind, because I work on juvenile fishes, the inshore component, when those that do survive and that make it in maybe on a lesser spawn from adults that recruit into salt marsh areas like we have, not so much Prince William Sound, mm -hmm. but they can be re-impacted by any oil that might be still left in the sediment because a lot of them feed in the sediment when they're juveniles down in these areas and can re-sort of uh, uh, influence themselves and so it's that they won't make it, to the, make it back to the spawning grounds as they get older. So there's probably three or four, maybe even more of those. Uh, herring is, is sort of an intriguing thing. There's been a lot of money and a lot of study of those for decades and they still really don't have the answer. So it's not as simple as the oil's gone Right. Fish are back this year, everything's great. It's, right. it's much more complex. Are there any, any particular species in the Gulf of Mexico that we're particularly concerned about? Um, I think, uh, I know that uh, um, uh, far offshore, some of our colleagues at the lab are working on bluefin tuna, and they're working on things like red drum and, and, and uh, other uh, sport fish. Uh, uh, Jim Frank spoke here uh, last time and, and talked about that. And so there's, there's people looking at those exact things, but they're concerned about blue crabs, very important economically. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they have this sort of estuarine dependent spawning offshore, moving inshore sort of pattern, uh, shrimp as well. Uh, and, and you saw certainly after Katrina that the shrimp and crabs were really abundant because they reduced harvest of those. But now that they're back harvesting, they've come back to a level and, it, and, and it's about where it used to be. So it clearly Katrina didn't impact them as much as we had originally thought. But this oil hanging on in the environment, this disappearing oil that people keep talking about, uh, until we figure out that impact, uh, uh, it could be a much longer process like they saw in Alaska. Okay, yeah, that's, that's uh, very important. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Friedrich talked about um, uh, her work with algae in the Gulf of Mexico, especially, you know, she looks at, at how, how the, uh, its presence affects the amount of oxygen that's bioavailable in, in the water column, and she's very concerned about the impacts on oil. Uh, Patrick, do you, uh, why is that so important? Why are scientists concerned about that? Well, the seaweeds, like many of the other organisms that are primary producers in the Gulf, those include phytoplankton, mm -hmm. they also include submerged aquatic vegetation, and uh, people might also consider salt marsh plants being important primary producers. So all of those plants uh, do produce oxygen as a byproduct. Um, and they are important habitat as well for many of the organisms, including some of the juveniles of species that Mark talked about earlier. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Brad Rosenheim uh, mentioned the problem with hypoxia and anoxia, the mm -hmm. low oxygen, no oxygen. Uh, what is that? What does that really mean? So generally, when you have these kinds of conditions, they tend to set up in the summer during warmer water conditions. Warmer water contains less oxygen. Uh, usually, hypoxia and anoxia set up uh, when there's a lot of phytoplankton blooming. Those phytoplankton don't all get consumed by organisms. Some of them die and sink to the bottom and are then broken down by bacteria. As those bacteria break down the dead organic matter from the phytoplankton, they're using up oxygen and will quickly use up all the available oxygen in the bottom waters. The problem of that is that animals require oxygen to survive, so if there's insufficient oxygen to support animal life like fish or crabs, then you get a die-off. Uh, a big example of that in the northern gulf is the dead zone just to the west of the Mississippi River mouth, uh, which fuels large phytoplankton blooms in the spring with all the nutrients that come down from the river. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Frederick also discussed um, uh, the uh, algal communities that she studies in, uh, in mostly in deep water systems, but she's very concerned about shifting, that there might always be algae there, but it might go from large algae to, uh, to uh, a, a smaller form of algae. Uh, does that have any impact on the fisheries that you study? It, it certainly can. I mean, there's been enough uh, work on that looking at 
sort of shifting from one sort of community structure, if you will. Usually, fish guys look at as vegetation as habitat for organisms. Uh, and if you shift that to a different kind, either a more structurally complex or a less structurally complex, uh, you get different prey availability on those things because, in part because of that complexity. And though fishes might shift to different places because of, of, in many ways, food availability, protection from predators, the things that make juvenile habitat really important to these, these young, or habitat for these young juveniles. Um, the other thing is that um, um, the normal prey that these things might feed on may not colonize a different structure. Uh, and so it's, again, a complex sort of thing, but the animals seem to know that. You know, and some, some new uh, structural components may not make much difference, but some might make a big difference. Mm -hmm. How about the shallow bed, uh, grass beds that you work on, Patrick? We haven't uh, seen much effect of the oil on those plants at this time. Uh, it's a little uncertain as to whether there might be longer term effects. I think we saw in one of the earlier segments, uh, Alex mentioned that oil in the sediments of the marshes was a concern. Uh, similarly for seagrasses, they would have the same kinds of problems as the marsh plants uh, with oil in the sediment affecting the roots and potentially causing mortality. So yes, that, that is a long-term uh, concern of mine. Okay, good. Um, well, one of the things that Dr. Andrew Whitehead uh, in the video was talking about the impact of future storms where they might mobilize some of the oil that's offshore and bring it inshore where it comes in contact. Um, uh, what are your concerns about that? Do you really think that that's going to happen? Uh, do, do the, does the scientific community really have a handle on that yet? I don't think we have a good handle on it, at least on the biology side of things. Uh, certainly if there's significant oil in deep waters that's easily mobilized that could come on shore, mm -hmm. I could see that as a potential you know, problem for the next year or so that we may see some oil coming up um, into the nearshore environment because of this deep pool. But it depends a lot on how quickly that oil might degrade and, and how quickly it might also settle out into the sediments yeah. where it would be a little less available to be moved. Right, so even though we don't know about it today, uh, we, uh, we think that it'll lessen as time goes on. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very one little interjection. Yes. One, one thing about marsh sediments is that it can get buried very quickly. And a lot of times when it's re-exposed, it sometimes in, in the literature would suggest that it still can be somewhat toxic. So it may not always go away or might not always be broken down. Because if it's, if it's separated from the oxygen, it, it's more problematic breaking it down. Well, that's you an have excellent that in point. Marshes. Excellent point. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. The BP oil disaster has created an unprecedented opportunity and need for scientists to create new ways of working together and to share data. Scientists from several Louisiana universities gave us their thoughts on these opportunities and avenues of scientific collaboration. I think with the oil spill, and I'm, I'm being hopeful here, it has made researchers realize they have to work together. It made researchers realize the value of their work. It goes beyond just having a publication. This is a way of recognizing the value not only of us in academia, but also the value of the people in the federal and state agencies who have these data, who are now actually newly, this is something new, uh, federal agencies releasing the data from certain uh, aspects in the Gulf. So it is something. I think it's a new opening and the idea that this is an excuse to we need to start sharing data just for the benefit of the public. It actually shows how different fields and different sciences come, can come together and provide a better assessment for uh, the impact of disasters. For example, in our project, it shows how physics, ecology, mathematics, statistics can all be combined to provide an assessment of the BP disaster on the marine mammals. Furthermore, recently, we've been contacted by NOAA. Uh, NOAA is actually uh, performing similar acoustic experiments. So we started now discussion and we hope that whatever data and analysis we conduct and whatever data and analysis they conduct can be shared and hence instead of one data set we will have several data sets providing corroborating evidence whether there has been an effect to this species or not. This spill um, scientifically and I, I I'm probably speaking for a lot of scientists, not just myself, but it's opened up a lot of new collaborations. As I said, I'm a paleoclimatologist, a paleoceanographer, and I use geochemistry as, as my tool. 
um, different aspects of geochemistry. That also turns out to be a very good tool for, for tracking oil, especially as it gets um, incorporated into our environment. So this has opened up collaborative doors for me to, uh, to work with other scientists, some who've had a lot more experience working with oil, which is, which is necessary because I need to learn a lot from them and, and hopefully they'll learn a lot from me. So there, there have been opportunities that, that come out of this in terms of, of being able to um, ask new scientific questions. So what scientists have to get a handle on is some integrated measure of exposure of sensitive habitats across the Gulf. And there are lots of sources of information there. Many of them are dispersed uh, between different agencies and different groups and in different areas. So what is really important is for us to figure out a way of integrating all those sources of information from people on the ground saying, I have a georeference site of oil here, versus people that have a chemistry sample from that site, where they've done the analytical chemistry, people that have a sediment sample from that site, and also integrating all the remote sensing data from the satellites into some integrative measure of exposure across time and across this geographical region. We need to figure out a way of having a central searchable database uh, to access those data from. The work that Chris Jenkins does, he does at the University of Colorado with his program DC Bed, uh, it's very cutting edge, the fact that they can actually bring these uh, data together and make them work together. If you want to see the interconnectivity of disciplines, this is the time that it really is exemplified. Everything from a good writer, uh, a good reporter, to someone who understands microbes is important in a situation like this. I am not a microbiologist, but I live and die right now by what the microbiologists are telling me about the decomposition rate of oil, and I've read up on it and I've had to learn about it. That's a totally different discipline from my own. By the same token, I'm not a, a geographic information system person that's doing a lot of the mapping, but it's mighty important to me right now how you map out this oil spill and so we're the biologists in the middle and there's many kinds of us. There's thousands of different kinds of experts that are needed right now. So it may sound like, oh gosh, here goes another expert shooting off his mouth. We need many different kinds of experts right now. They do need to talk to each other. They need to use each other's information. So we see from some of the scientists we visited that they are working in ways as never before across disciplines with others throughout the country and with the government to conduct research and share data. Dr. Bob Thomas has more on how scientists are coming together. Bob. Good. Thank you. Uh, our guests in this segment are Dr. George Crozier, the director of the Dolphin Island Sea Lab in Alabama. Welcome. Thanks, Bob. And Dr. Jeff Lotz, the department chair of uh, coastal studies and professor at the Gulf Coast Research Lab in Mississippi. Glad to be here. Good to have Thanks. you with us. Well, this excitement is really fun for scientists where all of a sudden people are collaborating that maybe used to be even in different buildings. And now we sit and talk about issues and we bring uh, into the conversation some of the things that our specialty and to your specialty and all of a sudden we come up with new ideas. One of the celebrated ones that I like to use with my students is dinosaurs. You know, when we were young, you knew about five or six dinosaurs and everybody knew what they looked like and had this image of what they looked like. And then all of a sudden in the 80s, you know, a, uh, a functional anatomist walked into a paleontologist lab and went, you know, you really think that dinosaur stands like that, but it doesn't because that, that bone would have to have a muscle mass that looks like this, which would make it stand a certain way. And another one walked in and said, you know, I've looked at cross sections of these bones and I'm starting to think these things are warm blooded, not cold blooded, which means they move fast. And all of a sudden the gates, the way they walk, the way they feed, the way they interact, changed markedly. And the rest is history, what we see on Discovery Channel today about dinosaurs. Uh, is this happening in your institutions, especially uh, in relation to the oil spill? Well, I think the, the uh, reaction is curiosity, and it was, it, it, it's certainly beyond buildings. I think one of the more interesting ones, we had researchers uh, come to the laboratory, which of course is essentially out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, and clean the, wind, the south-facing windows. Uh, scrupulously so that they could come back after a storm and look at what might have been blown in or air, you know, aerosoled yeah. uh, onto the landmass that the island represents. Uh, we've also been engaged in trying to get the scientists from around the state involved, uh, which was an interesting exercise for us. We had workshops where 115 scientists from 13 different institutions came together to make, work out a plan to try to do immediate research on the, at the Gulf, and that, this, is, this was different for us. Jeff? 
Well, yeah, we have a number of collaborations going on. You know, science generally is a deliberative and a collaborative endeavor, and, and it provides um, not only expertise, uh, of different expertises coming together to look at the s similar problems related to the oil spill or anything else. It also provides checks and balances. Uh, for example, if a scientist uh, has some data and, and wants to publish a paper, it's sent out to other scientists for review to make sure that you haven't made a big error and, right. and your assumptions and your methods are correct. And, and so that collaborations uh, are very important at that level. There are also the collaborations that were mentioned earlier in the, in the uh, introductory piece that that it's important to bring expertises together that are different and that and that creates a several problems the most important of which in this day and age with large amounts of data and large um, uh, amounts of uh, the ability to to transfer data is where are you going to put that data and where is it going to be and how are you going to vet it? Nobody wants to put just raw data out to right. be looked at. You're, you certainly are. But we, we have collaborations uh, all the way from the uh, University of Southern Maine uh, to the Hopkins, Hopkins uh, Marine Laboratory in California. And, and, uh, but most of our collaborations are in the Gulf of Mexico where, where the primary expertise, I believe, is, is, is mm -hmm. in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And you're crossing disciplines when you do that as well, not only spreading it around the, the country and the world, but also crossing disciplines and bringing to bear their information and their perspectives. Yeah, we have microbiologists, and certainly uh, if my area is really in the biological sciences. I'm actually an aquaculturist and look at, at infectious diseases in, in marine organisms. But uh, in this day and age, there's a, there's a lot of interest in gene expression. You mentioned the, the switch over in the dinosaurs from mm -hmm. the old lethargic, uh, lethargic uh, organisms to pretty fast sort of bird-like organisms. Well, the genomics or the gene expression is something that's coming into play and, and you can recognize some stresses through that activity that wasn't available as short a time ago as Exxon Valdez. Uh, well, I, I think one of the intriguing things <laughs> is that the chairman at the lab has had come up with an early cliche and, and uh, relative to this oil spill, his attitude was we don't even know what we don't know, which is a very cute cliche. It doesn't get you very far uh, down the road and where you need to be. And I think that this uh, part of the problem that we're dealing with is the urgency of, this, of these issues. People wanted to know what was happening. And of course, they wanted to know what's going to happen. And that was, that was a terrible mystery for all of us. We'd never experienced anything like this in our, in our environment. And it wasn't, it wasn't particularly useful to transfer Exxon Valdez to the Gulf of Mexico. The, the, the circumstances were so very different. Uh, and this is, I think, was what was frustrating to me. Uh, everybody within 300 miles of my voice knew what the hurricane would do if it came. And they want to know what's going to happen when this comes. And right. that was hopeless. <laughs> we had no clue. Right. And it's made it very difficult to anticipate what we needed to do in terms of research also. Yeah. Charles, the most commonly asked questions <coughs> these days and I'm talking about in conversation over coffee, in front of somebody interviewing you in the media, is where has the oil gone? What's your comment? Well, I, I think what bothers me is that it, it's, it's actually fairly honest to say that it's not oil anymore. And I think there's a misunderstanding or a perception of what crude oil was. And that oil started weathering the moment it hit the water 5,000 feet down in the Gulf of Mexico. And so the issue has become now is where is the carbon that was injected into the north central Gulf of Mexico that way. And in what form is it? Is it toxic? Have the, has the microbial community really de degraded this substance to the point where it's all carbon dioxide? Or is it turning into bacteria that are going to be eaten by copepods to be eaten by uh, fish that go all the way up the food chain? And are there going to be toxics? What components are toxic and remaining in this system? And those are the long-term questions we're going to be stuck with for a long time. So the oil may be gone, but the product of the oil and, and being exposed in the Gulf of Mexico remains there. And that's going to be the challenge, I think, to the scientific community mm -hmm. right. is to answer that big question. Right. Yeah, for the lay public, you know, we heard back on August 4th when NOAA made their pronouncement. They used the phraseology, only 26 percent of the oil is unaccounted for public took that to mean that it's all gone except for 26 percent, but in fact it was accounted for. 
the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, Jeff, do you have any, anything well, to Well, it, it certainly is. I mean, you, you say, well, the oil is gone because it doesn't float. We don't see anything on the surface and oil floats, but, mm -hmm. but as George said, it's, it's not oil anymore. It's weathered oil, partially degraded oil, and, and it's going to be around for a long time and has been around for a long time. And, and the issue of whether, how toxic it is, is certainly one that needs to be addressed. And, and we in the Gulf of Mexico are, are, are well able to do that. We raise a number of, uh, a number of species that are native to the Gulf of Mexico in the laboratory that can be used for studies on the oil that is in this condition, not mm -hmm. the oil that is crude as it comes out of the ground, but the mm -hmm. way it is now, and, and try to determine what might be the short-term as well as the long-term effects on that. Well, that's, th those are excellent points because uh, we're still thinking of this as crude oil, and it certainly isn't any longer, and so what the scientific community is dealing with is figuring out not only what's happening out there ecologically, but how is the product that we're monitoring changing, and I think that's very important. You know, another thing that, uh, that is on everybody's mind and has been uh, repeatedly reported is uh, a comparison of what happened in Prince William Sound to what happened uh, with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, what are your comments on that? Well, the, the, the comparisons are very poor. Uh, known volume of oil on the surface, close to the shore, delivered rather rapidly to the shoreline. We're dealing with oil that was released 5,000 feet down in, the, in a relatively warm environment compared to Alaska. Now, it's cold down at 5,000 feet. And I think the question has become, uh, ultimately, what we're going to have to decide is whether the use of the dispersants that kept a, some significant portion of the oil in submicroscopic droplets, which is fine. That's a bacteria-sized, bite-sized particle. That was the whole point of using the dispersants. And I think that's that has left us with a lot of uncertainty because it's at 3,000 feet or deeper. It's not even on the shelf and how long it's going to be there and in what form. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to balance that against the question how bad might it have been on the shoreline if we had not mm -hmm. used dispersants. And I don't think anybody really has the answer. The people that are confident about the dispersant being effective are saying, oh, it's going to be fine. There are those of us that are saying, well, we don't know much about deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's a, there's a lot of carbon out there. We don't know what form it's in. We don't know what percentage is toxic, and we don't know the impacts on the microscopic community. Right. And I, and I think the average person is thinking of that deep, they, they're thinking deep water, but they're thinking the surface world that we all live on. They're not realizing you're talking about 150 atmospheres mm -hmm. uh, of pressure down there. It's a mile. Uh, ju just above uh, freezing. It's a totally different environment yeah, as well. And, and so comparisons to Exxon Valdez right. are hopeless. Yeah. I think uh, and that's exactly right. The Exxon Valdez was quite a different animal. However, there are a few things that could be learned from it. And some of them are is, is that there are long-term effects for these oil spills. We saw that in Prince William Sound. Mm -hmm. So at least we should be prepared to look at this over the long term. Certainly, it was uh, in one of the intros earlier on where they talked about the herring, which is right. at the base of the food chain, uh, being depleted and not coming back and after mm -hmm. four or five years. And so these long-term effects from oil spills, mm -hmm. whether they're acute, and it's, they're not just acute events, and that's what needs to be kept in mind. I, I think one of the things that's going to emerge from this, to get back to your collaboration question, Bob, is that one of the things that we're very excited about is that we're providing a new laboratory space to the Food and Drug Administration laboratory. They have an analytical capacity that my little laboratory would never have, but we have the capacity to bring them samples from the environment, which right. they can then analyze. So we're looking at a long-term relationship with a federal agency that I think is going to bring a lot of power to bear on this long-term mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. and that, that's really what it's going to take. I mean, we're faced yeah. with, as from Exxon Valdez, 20 years of looking at very subtle effects in the ecosystem, effects that probably only people like us will actually appreciate in right. every sense of the word. Hopefully that it's just that subtle. Right. And, but we, and but we, we don't have, ever know what the application of those subtle differences right. are. No, exactly right. And we have collaborations like that that, that George is mentioning at our laboratory. We have a, a Gulf of Mexico marine hatchery program, which is an aquaculture program, which aquaculture, because we do raising of animals for food in closed system weren't affected by the oil, but in fact there's an opportunity to do land-based marine aquaculture to provide animals for studies as well as to provide, we do know that seafood production out of the Gulf of Mexico during that period was, was well reduced and here's an opportunity to look at a way to maybe fill in some of those gaps and if anybody were in fact lost their business because of the complications of Hurricane Katrina as well as perhaps not being able to fish during right. uh, this at aquaculture is an opportunity, and that's a collaborative uh, program that we have in our laboratory. Excellent. Well, look, 
we have just a minute left in closing. Uh, do y'all think that one of the positive outcomes here may be that we that the nation refocuses some of its interest in uh, studies of the Gulf of Mexico? Well, I think that the the fragility of the system has been more than documented. Right. So I think there is going to have to be that concern. And uh, in the wake of Katrina, I hope people will put the two together. Certainly, there's a there's there's been a bit of a shift in 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 recognizing across the nation how important the Gulf of Mexico is, and I think it's been very much understudied and and probably undervalued. And when we hope that we can maintain the interest of the country and 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 the scientific community in the Gulf of Mexico for a long time. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you thank being you with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Now, we also want to let you know you can find more on our companion website at SpillScience.com. There you can find in-depth information about topics related to the spill, as well as video discussions from scientists studying the effects of the spill on the Gulf of Mexico. You may also want to join the discussion on our blog section of the site, where you can engage in discussions with scientists studying the impacts from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Again, that's SpillScience.com. And that's all for this edition of The Science of the Spill. Until next time, I'm Aaron Pickens. And I'm Dr. Bob Thomas. This program was made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation, a co-production by Mississippi Public Broadcasting and the University of Southern Mississippi Gulf Coast Research Laboratory.